Welcome back to the University of Idaho and University of Wyoming Extension Sheep and Goat webinar series that we do once a week on Thursdays at 1230 Mountain Time. Um, for updates on any of the events, webinars, other information that we have for you guys, make sure you're following our Facebook page at UI Sheep and Goats and or at UW Sheep. Um, I am Melinda Ellison, you're one of your hosts. Um, I'm the UI Extension Sheep Specialist. Uh, Whit Stewart is another host. He's the University of Wyoming Extension Sheep Specialist. And Carmen Wilmore, who is also your speaker today, is our third host from um, Lincoln County University of Idaho Extension. So um, I will go ahead and turn this over to Carmen, who's going to be visiting with you guys today about um, sheep and goat dairies. So I will pass it over to you. Thanks, Carmen. Awesome. Thanks, Melinda. Um, so like Melinda said, today I'm going to give kind of an introduction to owning dairy goats and sheep. Um, this is going to be a very elementary type of presentation. Uh, it's really designed for people that are looking to get into owning a few dairy goats or sheep, um, or if you have other animals and you want to kind of expand on what you have, um, just some things to keep in mind there, especially um, as far as milking goats and sheep and some different practices you should be following um, if that is what you're going to do. So the first thing I wanted to address um, is why people want to own dairy goats and sheep. So um, my husband and myself, we do own many, it's starting to grow more and more, um, dairy goats. And we do sell our milk through a raw herd exception license with the state of Idaho. Um, there's quite a few other small goat, uh, own, small dairy goat breeders and owners in the area that do the same thing. Um, and so we started out with milk goats as kind of like a family milk goat, and then it kind of led into this kind of a side business for us. And so that's something that I think quite a few people can find themselves kind of evolving into. And I think it's kind of an interesting way to get a taste for um, what the dairy business might be on a very small scale, but you still kind of see what it's like to do the day-to-day -day, um, activities. So some people get into it uh, looking for a family milk goat. I have a lot of people that contact me looking for uh, nurse goats, so nanny goats that they can then milk um, and have that, that milk for bottle kids and lambs. Um, that's something that's getting more and more popular. People like using goat milk to raise um, that young stock on, and it is a really good um, alternative to using the powdered milk and using milk replacer and things, but it is something to be mindful of as far as when you're gonna breed that animal so that they have milk at the right time as well as, you know, are you gonna continue milking them year round, having milk for yourself um, or other, you know, other things that you might use it for. Um, obviously you're gonna sell the milk. Most people, um, most people do, maybe on a large scale through to a creamery. Um, some people do it on a small scale with a raw milk license. It just kind of depends on the scale of your operation and what your end goal is. And then cheese making and soap making. Um, Again, soap making is something, I sell a lot of our milk to soap makers because if you get into the soap making business, you realize you don't need that much goat milk to make a lot of soap. So sometimes it doesn't make sense to own a herd of milk goats um, just to make soap. So that's something, if that's something you're looking into, maybe just contacting a local um, dairy or someone like myself that has a small herd license um, and asking them for soap that you or milk that you can purchase to make soap. So the next part um, that I wanna go over, cause I think it's important for people to understand the different breeds um, that are specifically designed for dairy production. And so I'm gonna go through the goat breeds and then a couple of sheep breeds. I will be completely honest, I am a goat person. So I don't know a ton about the sheep breeds, um, but if you have questions, I can certainly do some research and find some more information for you um, if that's something you're looking into. So the first breed I have here is the Nubian. This is uh, the breed that we own and raise. They're a great um, family friendly goat. They don't really have a lot of attitude problems. Like some of the larger breeds can be a little more, I wouldn't say aggressive, but they're just larger. So it's not as easy for young kids and people like that to um, handle them. They are a very popular breed. Um, 
They're distinguished by that long drooping ears and their Roman nose. And they're known for the high butterfat content, um, though they do have some of the lowest overall producers. So they have really high quality milk, but maybe don't produce as much as say a larger breed like a Salmon or an Alpine might. Um, they thrive in warmer weather, but they can also handle any climate. And I would say um, we have not had any problems with them in, in Southern Idaho. We've had a few cold days. Um, we really have a pretty temperate uh, climate in Jerome but they do well in the heat or in the cold. We haven't had a lot of problems with that. So the next breed is the Sonnen. Um, they're the all white breed with standing ears and a dished face. On average, they do produce the most milk, but they tend to have lower fat and protein levels. So this is a breed, if you are gonna be doing something like making cheese or soap, um, maybe you would choose a different breed because they're gonna have a lot of milk, but it won't be as high of quality. So they're not gonna have as much production uh, per pound of milk in, in that cheese and the soap. They did originate in Switzerland and so they say they have a Swiss character so they're a little more temperamental um, and they do tolerate cold weather so they are a good cold weather animal. Next is the Toggenberg. Um, they're brown with white faces and rump markings. They all have the same look and that's how you know that they're a Toggenberg. They're known for long, steady lactations, and they have a closer protein to fat ratio, so they're a little bit better um, than the Sonnen for, for things like cheese making and, and stuff like that. And they do have that long lactation, so they're a goat, um, especially if you are trying to achieve year-round milk production, they would be a good breed um, to have as part of your herd because they could maybe kid at the same time as everyone else but then you could drag that long uh, lactation out longer to overlap animals that you might dry off to kid again. So they're one breed um, that has been designed to accomplish that. And then there's the Alpines. Uh, they have the erect ears. They have varying color patterns, kind of like the Nubian. They can kind of look a little bit like anything, um, but typically they kind of have these black and gray, um, sometimes brown and white markings uh, to distinguish that, that breed. And then they also have good health and very aggressive eaters as kids. Alpines are also really good pack goats because they do grow so quickly. Um, they can be used for packing and they have a good um, strong frame for packing uh, in the mountains and things like that. And then there's the La Manchas. Um, we just recently got a La Mancha and I would say that they, she does attract the most attention because of her unusual ears. Um, I don't know what it is about the La Manchas, but people seem to really think they're, they're cool looking because they have those little gopher ears. Um, and people always think, oh, they got bitten off or frostbit or whatever. And nope, they're just born that way. So they're kind of a cool, cool little goat um, just because of that. They are the only breed that originated in the United States. They were developed in uh, California and their milk is very high in butter fat. And I would say um, we haven't really noticed a difference between her milk and the milk from our Nubians. So it is a really good um, milk. It doesn't have any off flavoring. Um, and overall, they're still a really good breed, especially for um, like a family milker. They have that good quality milk that you could make multiple products out of um, and still just have a few goats. And then the last Oberhasli, they are brown and black and they do have the lowest production, um, but as, they're kind of also a new breed. So as that breed is selected more, we will hopefully see higher uh, milk production coming out of that breed as far as their registration um, and increasing the breed average. So now I'll move into our two sheep breeds that I was gonna mention. There's the East Frisian. Um, they do have the highest milk production and the longest lactation of dairy sheep breeds. They can produce five to 700 kilograms of milk per lactation. And um, the one thing to know is that their offspring can be pretty fragile. And so it's important, as with a lot of these small ruminant um, offspring, the kids and lambs, they do need a little extra care to have high survivability in their lamb crop, just because um, sometimes, especially with dairy animals, those teats can be really, um, you know, engorged right after parturition. And so it's important if you are gonna let them nurse um, to help them 
latch on because sometimes that that teat can be very hard for them to get onto. Um, and so especially with these lamb breeds, it's important to to make sure that they can get that attachment. Or if you're going to bottle feed them, milk out that colostrum and get it in a bottle for them. And then the second sheep breed is the Lacuni sheep. They're the second most common dairy sheep in the U.S. And kind of like the difference between a Saanen and a Nubian in the dairy breeds, um, the Lacuni sheep have higher um, total solids than the Frisians, but less volume. So a lot of uh, dairy sheep in the U.S. will actually be a composite breed of the two to help accomplish, you know, high production, but also good, good components so that you still have a good um, milk product, especially sheep. A lot of their milk is used to make cheese. So you want to make sure that you have um, the right component to have a high cheese yield um, and not so much waste. So the next thing I wanted to address is um, I have people, you know, as a producer and working in extension that always want to know uh, what's a fair price for a dairy, a dairy goat or a dairy, uh, dairy you. And it's, it's kind of, you get what you pay for. And I, I hope people take that the right way and don't find it offensive. But if you want a good goat or a good you, you're going to need to pay for it. Um, and what I mean by that is, to determine that fair price, um, you kind of have to look at what it costs to own a goat, right? So the average cost to feed a dairy doe or a ewe for one year um, is about $125 to $150. This is on average about 30 cents a day just in feed. Um, and so that could be, and that price can change a lot depending on what you're feeding. If you're feeding a lot of pasture, then it's probably quite a bit cheaper because hopefully you're not paying very much for your pasture. Um, but if you're feeding hay year round or if you're feeding grain year round with your hay, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. So um, definitely consider that when you're not only when you're looking to go buy a goat or, a, or you, uh, but also when you're going to own it, make sure you have um, the funds and the resources to make sure that they have a good um, nutrition base as well. So goats and ewes that come from a regularly tested and clean herd um, would also have an additional $25 to $50 premium due to those health testing records. Um, so what I mean by a clean herd is our herd and quite a few um, registered, even non-registered herds in our area that I know of are starting to test for, um, to have, to sell raw milk, you have to test for tuberculosis and brucellosis annually. So that is a cost. And then um, we also test for CAE, CL, and Yonis which I'm not gonna get into those diseases today because I think we've had a few discussions on diseases. And if not, we can always have a whole day dedicated to those things. Um, but I didn't, didn't wanna go over it today, but those are just, those are wasting diseases essentially in sheep and goats that um, if you do the right thing and you keep them out of your herd, it will pay in the end. Because if, some, if one of those diseases gets into your herd and your entire herd is contaminated, that is gonna cost you a lot of money, not only to cull those animals, um, but also treat any animals, uh, especially your young stock, not being able to sell them for what they may be worth. You know, They may have great genetics and all these amazing attributes, but they also test positive for CAE. And that's you know obviously not gonna be good. Um, and so you're gonna to have to euthanize them or sell them. So those are just things to consider when you look at animals, um, especially starting out, it is, in my opinion, much easier to go out and buy an animal from a tested herd so you don't have to worry about those issues um, than to just go buy something and have no clue. That's just my little soapbox. Um, but it does cost more, and that's another thing to consider. Also, registered females would have an additional cost, and that should be based on how much milk they produce and any other positive heritable traits, you know, are they, do they have a good temperament? Do they have a really nice, nice teat? Do they have good udder attachment? Do they have good feet and, feet and legs? Um, those aren't things I'm going to go over a lot today, but we can also have, because that would be a whole 45 minute presentation. So those are things we can go over in the future, but those are all things that you should look at when purchasing a goat. And the better goat you can get, the more it's probably going to cost, but it will also pay for itself in the end.
So the other thing is um, I kind of have people be like, oh, I found this goat for $50 at the sale or whatever it may be. And I just have kind of a cautionary warning with the bargain goats and sheep. Um, sometimes that low price is really not a good deal. If you bring that animal home and it either turns out not being a good dairy animal, um, it brings a disease into your herd that then you're treating everyone and having to have the vet come out and, and treat for different worms or whatever it may be, even if it's not a disease. Still, if they bring in worms or ore for ringworm, something like that, that you're still gonna have to treat, it's not really worth it in the end. Um, so just before you buy something, really ask yourself, is the risk of purchasing this animal really worth it if they were to bring something into my herd? So definitely um, working with reputable breeders will help you in, with that. Um, you can talk to Melinda or myself. Um, we both are kind of in the industry. And so we know people that might have really good animals for sale. If you're interested, we can always help with those things as well. So the next part I'll talk about is feeds and feeding of dairy animals. So um, it's important to think about, um, especially starting out, is it economical for you as the producer to um, you know, produce your own forages and other crops, or are you gonna need to purchase those and bring them onto your property? I would say for most of us who are purchasing them and bringing them onto our property. Um, for us, it does, we, do not have enough land to make all the hay and certainly all the grain that we wanna feed our livestock. So we just purchase that and then have pasture. We use the rest of it as pasture. Um, also think about what type of forages fit your farm situation. Um, and, and another thing with this is what type of um, forages you could feed. So maybe you could get some big square bales, but if you don't have the ability to unload those or to feed them in a timely manner, it's probably not really worth it to have them. I know a couple of years ago, we were getting a lot of feeder hay, for, big square bale feeder hay um, from my father-in-law because that's what we had available. But then we ended up feeding it for forever and um, it was really not easy to feed it. There was so much waste because the flakes were so big and goats kind of are picky anyways. And so um, it really didn't work out being the best for us. And because it was feeder hay, it really didn't do, the goats didn't do as good on it because it wasn't as high quality of a, of a hay as we could get with alfalfa and some other feeds. Um, so now we buy small bales of alfalfa. It's much simpler to feed. Um, it's easier for us to move it around. If we have to move a couple bales, it's no big deal. We don't have to get the tractor out. So just things like that to consider um, when you're purchasing, purchasing your forages. Um, the next thing is which feeding program would fit your farm situation. If you, um, you know, are looking to get into a big dairy, probably a total mix ration, which would be, um, it's kind of like, if you don't know what it is, it's almost like a casserole for, for livestock. So it would have your roughages. So it would have your hay, um, your silage, whatever that may be. And then it may have your supplements, your grain, corn, barley, whatever feed it is, it's all mixed in one and then fed in a feed bunk, kind of like a casserole or a salad for goats. Um, so that's one option. You could also do individual grain feeding. This is what we do on our farm. Um, we feed hay in a feed bunk and then we feed um, their grain when they're being milked. And this works really well for us because then we can kind of feed how much they need. And then you can also do group feeding, um, top dressing. So you put your hay down and then top dress that with your concentrate. Um, that can be really helpful if you have them all kind of eating the same thing, but if you're trying to feed some a little more or others a little less, it can be a little harder with that. And then obviously grazing if you have pasture available. Um, also, when you think about what you're gonna be feeding and how, you need to consider what your farm's milk production and component goals will be. Um, if you aren't as concerned about components, you probably don't have to feed as high of a um, protein and energy ration because they just kind of need maintenance and then have some milk, but maybe you're not looking to up the protein and fat in that, in that milk um, that they're producing. So that's another thing, especially it just depends on the market for your milk on what you're going to feed to achieve your market. So when meeting your requirements, I always kind of think of 
our animals on our farm in two groups. There's those that have a little bit of a higher requirement. Those will be our yearling milkers. So it's their first, it's their first time kidding, their first time uh, giving birth, and then also their first time uh, lactating. And so I make sure that they have enough to meet all those needs and hopefully not um, lose too much condition. Almost all of our animals after they kid and they start milking, they're gonna lose some condition. And then after a few months, they'll start to gain it back. Um, so that's to be expected. But leading into that, we try and make sure that they have enough condition to kind of still be able to um, be on the uphill slide going through all those changes. And then our higher producing does and use will tend to have a higher requirement to make sure that they're hitting um, the highest production they can. And then animals in weight gestation also have a high requirement. Our lower requirements are those lower producing animals and then our dry does. Um, our dry does we put out on pasture and they just stay there until about three weeks before um, parturition, then we'll bring them in and start supplementing again. Our lower producing does, what I mean by that is, um, especially this time of year, we do milk um, some of our animals for almost 14 months. So we have a little overlap um, with our milk milk production so we can sell milk 12 months a year. Um, but at this time of year, we'll see some of them start to kind of drop off in their lactation. And as they drop off, they don't require as much grain. And so if they're only producing, you know, we're milking one time a day right now. So if they're only producing three and a half, four pounds of milk a day with that once a day milking, I'm not going to feed them as much grain as those that are still producing six pounds of milk a day. And so um, I, I might feed them, you know, three cups of grain, whereas the six pounds a day milkers are going to get four and a half or five. So that's just something, those lower requirements, they get less feed. You know, they all still get hay, but they may get less grain. And they, they would still eat all the grain if I gave it to them, but they're not going to produce any more milk. And so it's just kind of a cost effective um, thing that we do. So we're not wasting grain on something that's not going to produce more milk. And then another thing to really consider here with those animals with higher and lower requirements is you can sort your herd into two or three groups to meet those needs without over or under feeding other animals. Um, we do this a lot, especially leading into um, our kidding season or lambing season for those with sheep, making sure that those younger animals, that this is their first, um, this is their first kidding season we wanna make sure that they are not having to fight for hay or grain. And so we might put them in a separate pen with other animals their size, so there's not so much competition. And then you can also feed individually when milked to help make sure that you're meeting those individual animal requirements. So when feeding sheep and goats, um, they don't like fine particles in their feed. So they will sort and only eat what they want. And I think if you own a goat or a sheep, that you would be able to say that as well. Um, they are very good at sorting out what they want to eat. Um, you can also feed pelletized feed that can help reduce sorting. Uh, we do feed a pelletized grain and we have had some problems with it um, being crushed and having a lot of fine particles. And so that's something to be uh, mindful of that those, that they don't sort because there's too much fine fines in the feed. So like we actually got to the point where we had to use um, like a colander to sort out the, you know, the fine dust pretty much so that they would actually eat the grain because they stopped eating the grain because there was too much dust in it. So that's kind of unfortunate, but it's just um, something, <coughs> excuse me, to be mindful of. So the next thing to keep in mind is goats do need to consume um, about four to six percent of their body weight per dry, uh, body weight in dry matter every day, and sheep need to consume about two to four percent um, of their body weight in dry matter. So when you're purchasing hay for the year, which most of us do, you know, in the fall, late summer, we purchase our hay for the following year. Um, we could probably do that in a in another day, but definitely um, calculate how many goats you have how much, you know, estimate how much they weigh and then how much they're going to eat over 365 days. And that's how I know how much hay to purchase for the year for our farm. So the next thing is um, intake and feeding behavior. So 
They do have a lower digestive capacity than cattle, uh, goats do, but they have a higher level of intake. And so um, what helps that is they have very wide mouths and they have a lot of mobility. So they can select a lot um, for their diet so that they're eating higher quality food to meet their requirements. They do reduce that um, particle size of feed more than cattle, especially if you're gonna feed a total mixed ration. Um, the particle size of that chop has to be smaller than what you might feed you know, to a dairy cow because obviously dairy cows have larger mouths. And so if you fed that to a goat, they would select and only eat the things that they want. They wouldn't eat the whole ration. Um, they also have higher fiber particle breakdown and higher concentrate particle breakdown. And so another interesting thing with goats that um, I think is really cool is they can cope with some anti-nutritional factors, which, which that really means is they can eat things that aren't quite as nutritious um, and be okay. So they have a lot of, they can eat, you know, poisonous plants and be okay within reason um, because they have saliva and compounds that can limit the negative actions of those tannins and toxins. So you may see goats being used as, um, what am I thinking, noxious weed management on range and things like that because they have this ability to eat these products without getting sick. Um, not completely. You still do need to be mindful of molds and things in your feeds with goats. They can still um, be at risk from those things. But um, when it comes to some of these other weeds and things like that, they can eat those and be okay. Uh, so the next thing is goats do digest fiberless than cows and they are helped by um, fine chopping of those forages more than cows, like I said earlier. They can digest starch, um, but they do select more than cows. And I think we talked about that, and especially on pasture. And I've seen this a lot as well. They will eat from the top down, including seed heads. And I wish I could have got this video on here. Um, we have a goat that will go out. And if we have any um, mature thistle, which we try not to, but if we have any, she will eat the seed head off of the top. She kind of waits for them to get dry. And then she will go out and eat the top of them off, which to me is great because she's helping keep the keep them out of my pasture. Um, but it's just kind of an interesting thing because cows and sheep really graze more to the ground, whereas goats, if you watch, are always looking up. That's why they eat all the branches off your trees and things like that, because that's just kind of their natural uh, behavior of grazing. So the next thing to consider um, with dairy, sheep, and goats is their comfort. So the more that a doe or a ewe is lying down chewing her cud, the more milk she will produce because that means that she is relaxed, she's been fed, she has plenty of water, she's not searching for feed or water so she can sit down and chew her cud. Um, milkers should not be overcrowded. If they do uh, or if they are overcrowded, that can increase their stress and then reduce that milk production. So in general, you need about 20 to 30 square feet per animal if you have any type of enclosure. Um, if they are gonna have outdoor space, it doesn't have to be quite that big because um, they'll have that outdoor space to spread out. And then your bunk space should be a minimum of 12 to 13 inches per animal. If you're only gonna be feeding uh, one time a day, if you're gonna be limit feeding where you feed once and they have to eat it all at that one time, um, it has to be the 12 to 13 inches. If you will have constant uh, feed available to them, that could be a little bit smaller at about 10 to 11 inches. Uh, one of the most important things is a clean, constant um, source of fresh water. So if, I always like to think if you won't drink the water, they won't drink the water. Um, especially goats can be very picky if there's like a limb or a couple of, you know, leaves in their water, they're not going to drink it. So definitely um, make sure they have water, especially dairy animals, because they're producing so much milk and eating so much feed, they really need fresh water constantly. Because um, the more that they drink, the more that they're going to produce. And then goats do perform warm water and will decrease water intake below 41 degrees. And then at 60 degrees, um, they will drink a four to one ratio of water. So if they drink five pounds of hay, or if they eat five pounds of hay, they're gonna drink 20 pounds of water. 
So um, that's really important to make sure that they have enough water um, to meet their needs. And I've noticed a lot, um, especially right now, I'm noticing it because uh, we have tank heaters in now. Our pasture goats don't drink near as much water as what our, um, our dairy herd does. Because our dairy herd, when you think about it, they have you know a dry ration, they have dry hay, they have dry grain. Whereas those that are going out on pasture, it's still um, fall pasture, so it has a lot of moisture to it, so they don't consume as much water. So it's another thing to consider. Um, if you are pasturing animals, maybe they aren't gonna consume as much water, but as you transition them onto a hay ration to account for that. So the next thing is bedding. Um, Bedding should also be clean and dry. When you kneel down in the bedding, no matter what time of year, summer, spring, or fall, um, if your knees get wet, it needs to be cleaned out. Or if you have a deep bed system, you need to add more uh, straw or bedding on top so that it's dry. And this is important because if they lay down there and it's wet, then that bacteria is gonna contaminate the teat and then that's gonna contaminate um, potentially your milk supply. So it's really important thing, especially with dairy animals, to have clean and dry bedding. Dry bedding is really important. Um, and I like the kneel test because then, you know, if my knees get wet, then I know that they're getting wet when they lay down too. So the next thing um, with sheep and goats is feeder design. I think we'll probably talk about this in a few weeks as well, but animals should not be able to get into the feeder or put their feet in it. Uh, this is really important because if they can get their feet in it, then they're going to contaminate all the feed, right? Um, and so these are two designs that we actually use. So there's kind of the bunk design over here on the left-hand side, and then the stand-up design um, on the right-hand side. I really like the bunk. Our feed bunks that we have are perfect. Um, I really like them. They are kind of hard for... Um, to design so that if you have young stock in there, if you're letting, you know, the mother's nurse or whatever, um, they can't get in the feeders, which is good, but then kind of bad because then they can't quite learn how to eat hay at a younger age. They have to wait until they're a little bit older. But then it also keeps them out of the hay so they're not pooping in it and that kind of stuff. Um, these stand-up feeders, I like a little bit better for that reason because, you know, the babies, they can get up there and eat, um, but then they're standing in the feed bunk, which is again, not what we really want. So it's just kind of a, whatever your preference is. Um, we use both, there's positives and negatives to both. So it's just something that you'll have to make a decision on um, as far as your farm. If you have ideas or questions on how to build these, um, let Melinda or I know we can help you with that. So the next thing is housing and equipment. So i um, not gonna go into a ton of detail here just because it totally depends on how big of an operation you want and what you're even starting out with. If you're on a small acreage, you might just start with a few little um, bully barns that they can get in and out of during, um, you know, cold, hot weather, things like that. Uh, but if you're really going into, I'm going to build this dairy and have a lot of animals, um, some of these open barns with these big garage doors, so you can close them and open them um, depending on the weather are really nice, especially for goats. Um, that way they can kind of feel more, um, they have an area that they can be and not be uh, exposed to the elements. Sorry, I was trying to think of the right word there. So the, this is a dairy that I visited um, and it was really nice setup. They had different pins that all had access to outside, inside, and they could close the doors during bad weather to keep the animals um, you know, keep the snow off them and things like that. As far as equipment, again, that's going to just depend on um, how big of an operation you want. So with our license, we milk seven goats and we just use this little simple pulse milker. We have it mounted onto a dolly so we can uh, bring it out, milk, and then take it in the house to do all the cleaning um, on our, in our house. We have like a second kitchen and we do all the cleaning in there. And so that's kind of what works for us. Um, milking stands need to be, I can't remember exactly how tall ours is, but I bet it's probably about 12 inches. We have a double stand. Um, we've used singles, doubles. I like the double because I can obviously milk two at a time. Um, again, it kind of depends what you have available. 
and what you, um, what works for your farm and in your space. So now I'm into the milking side of things. So milking basics, does and use should be milked on 12 hour intervals. That udder is constantly producing milk and it will only stop when it is completely full. So you don't ever really want it to get completely full because then the next time that you go out to milk, it's not gonna produce quite as much. Um, so that's an important thing to think about, especially getting into dairy animals is, can I be there every 12 hours to milk them? Or if I can't be there, can I train someone that I can pay whatever it is gonna be um, to go milk my animals for me if I can't get home? So that's something they definitely do take a time commitment um, to milk them twice a day. Some people milk once a day. Um, we milked twice a day about until August and then we started milking once a day. Uh, this is kind of a new thing for us and it actually has worked really well. We don't have to worry about getting home at the exact perfect time to milk in the afternoons anymore. Um, so that's kind of a relief. Uh, and again, even with milking once a day, you kind of still have to be mindful you're gonna get a, a dip in production. So ideally, a doe or you will get bred and have a five-month gestation. After giving birth, she'll be milked for on average seven months and then uh, get bred again, continue that lactation to 10 months, and then be dried off for 60 days before kidding. This is a pretty typical milking scenario for a dairy um, animal, goats and sheep. Um, some people will decide to just continue milking. And then after they're done milking, then they'll rebreed. You have a longer dry period that you have to feed them for. Um, but that's, again, a management decision you'll have to make on your own. That is what we do. It is just easier for us to dry them off, get them bred, put them out on pasture for a few months until they're ready to come back in and, and kid and milk. Um, does can be milked for longer and maintain a steady lactation. But do be mindful, the longer that they are milking, I hope you guys don't hear that train going by. Um, the longer that they are milking, their somatic cell count will increase. Um, that's just kind of how it works. The longer that they milk, that somatic cell count will just increase over time. Um, if you see it spike, definitely test for mastitis because it can also be an indication of mastitis. Um, but it's just kind of a, something to expect. So to produce high quality milk, there's three things that I think are really important. You have to have properly cleaned milking equipment, um, whether you're you know, a smaller operation, hand milking using stainless steel buckets, um, it still has to be sanitary. Your hands have to be sanitary. That equipment has to be sanitary. Um, you need to follow a sanitary milking procedure, which I'll get to in a minute, and then having Females with healthy udders makes a big difference. <laughs> um, and, and you may just look at a goat and say, oh yeah, she has a great udder. But until you really put your hands on it and you see how the orifice functions, um, how, how their teeth fits into the claws, things like that, you won't really know completely how, they're, how healthy that udder is and how well they're gonna milk. Um, so that's another thing to just be really Pay attention to that um, when purchasing your goats. So um, grade A milk is obviously sold for the purpose of bottling for fluid milk sales, yogurt, ice cream, and other products. And then grade B is sold for the purpose of cheese making. And I'm gonna go through just a few standards for grade A and grade B, just for people to keep in mind um, if that's what they choose to go into. As a raw milk license, um, these standards are different and they are different by state as well. And since we have people logging on from different states, um, I didn't put all of that on here. Sorry about that. Hopefully someone will answer that. Um, but you can always send me a question. I'll try and help you get the resources for your specific state so that you know um, what kind of standards are in place in your area. So the first thing is bacterial count standards. So for grade A, that's 100,000 CFUs per mil, and grade B is 300,000. On most lab reports, this will be noted as a plate count, so a PC. And I know on our lab reports, that is what it is, is a PC. And so the number it shows might actually say, you know, 10 
but then you actually have to multiply that by a thousand. So it's 10,000. So sometimes it might say two, but really it's 2000. So just something to think about there. And then there's the somatic cell count standard. Um, grade A is less than a million and grade B is less than um, 1,500,000. And again, it's the same thing. It has to be multiplied by a thousand. So if you see it say 550, that's actually 550,000. Um, interesting thing about somatic cell count is it can be increased by um, a longer lactation or late in lactation, it will increase. During estrus, it will have an increased somatic cell count. I have totally seen this happen with our animals. When they are in heat and I submit a sample, I will see that go up and then the next, next month it'll be right back down. So another thing that I have had little heart attacks about being like, oh man, what's causing that? And then I test everybody and they're fine because it was just that one of them or two of them were in heat and so it spiked. And then also uh, mastitis. Definitely you can see a peak in somatic cell count because of mastitis. Um, we have experienced this and if you do start seeing that, you can take individual samples from all of your goats and turn them in and ask for a mastitis culture and they will culture that milk for um, bacteria that cause mastitis. And then you can see if, if you really have something going on um, in your animals and especially individual animals. And then the next thing is temperature. So this is within two hours of milking. Grade A milk has to be um, at a temperature of less than 45 degrees and grade B is less than 50 degrees. Um, again, how you cool your milk is really important. Um, it's honestly just as important as sanitation. Um, and so if you have questions on cooling milk, you can all, I don't know if I'll actually have my email at the end, but I'll give you my email um, and I can give you some different ideas there as well, if that's an issue you're having. So the next thing I'm going to go through is a milking procedure. This is a five-step milking procedure, um, pretty basic. So I'm going to go through it as quick as I can. So you'll use a 0.5% um, iodine product. You'll spray that on the teat. Um, the teat should not have any dirt or debris. So when I first bring them in, if there's, you know, some straw or hay um, on their teat, I'll wipe that off with a paper towel. Spray the pre-dip on. Um, it should cover three quarters of the way up, and then it needs to remain on the teat for 30 seconds. Um, that 30 seconds is really important so that it can actually kill any bacteria that is on the teat, um, and so you have a sanitary surface. After that pre-dip, um, you'll, you'll do your force stripping. So use a force strip like what's in this picture um, and you will squirt three or four squirts of milk into the cup. And then our, our um, cup, which is in this picture, has this uh, like little grate in it. And so if there's any chunks or something, you'll see that. And so I kind of will like squirt it on the different sides. Um, that way if anything, if there's any chunks in that milk, I'm gonna see it come out in those first three or four squirts. Um, and so then you check for any of those abnormalities and, um, and if it looks good, then you can move on. It is important, the highest bacteria and somatic cell are in that teat cistern. So those first few squirts of milk that you get are gonna be the ones with the highest bacteria. So that's important if you're taking a sample, um, usually they say to kind of not use that milk. Um, try and use what's actually going to go into the tank for those samples. Uh, but also it's important to get that out. That way you don't have a high tank sample um, and use that milk and just throw it out, which is what we do. So the next step is adequate drying. So now you would dry off the teat. Um, this is really important because you don't want any moisture between that teat and your milking claw. Because again, that's where bacteria could grow. Um, we use paper towels if they have a lot of, uh, you know, pre-dip on them. Sometimes I'll use two paper towels, but I use one paper towel for one goat. You don't use the same towel for multiple animals, so you don't have any cross-contamination. But you can use the same paper towel on both teats um, if, if that's what you need to do. The next step is attaching the claw. So after the initial stimulants for milk let down, which is that that stripping. Um, it'll take about 20 to 60 seconds for that oxytocin response to start, and then that will last about five or six minutes. 
Um, so you want to get those claws on so that milk uh, can start being milked out. It is important not to stimulate more goats, then you can get milk, milked out during that time. So for us, we just do two at a time. So I can um, do all of the kind of step one through three together, and then I'll put the claw on one. When she's done, then I'll take it off um, and put it onto the next goat. Machines should definitely fit the teat and not slip off. Um, and then also do not over milk. This can cause damage to the teat end and the udder. And um, I can definitely say I have accidentally done this. We have some goats that may milk um, more out of one side than the other. So if that's the case, I'll put the claw on that side that milks more first and just hold the second claw for you know 30, 45 seconds. And then I'll put it onto the second teat that way they finish at the same time because it's really hard to get one claw off of a side that's done while leaving the other one on. But if I start with the one on and then I can add the second one later. And then the last step is the post dip, which um, is pretty simple. You just spray or dip the teat in a solution post milking. Um, this can reduce the bacteria found in the milk left on the teat skin and is really important part, especially um, if it is you know, winter time, especially post dipping during the winter time, I think it's really important because they are going to lay down more. Um, and so there's going to be a lot more that they could get on that tee. And so I think it's important. I had an email earlier and I'll try and address it. Um, they were asking if you still post dip, I think it was, do you still post dip even with cold temperatures, things like that? And my answer is yes. Um, sometimes we'll post dip. We use an iodine spray, so it is a liquid spray. Um, we'll post dip and then kind of give it a few sec, you know, again, another 30 seconds, and then I'll wipe off any excess so there's not as much moisture there that could cause any frostbite issues. There are um, powder post dips that you can kind of push up onto their udder um, as another way to still help close that orifice back up and sanitize the teat until your next milking. So um, drying off, so this is drying off does when they're done lactating. Uh, so to dry off, you can milk every other milking for three or four days and that'll start stimulating them to produce less and less milk. You can completely stop milking altogether. Um, I'll be honest, that's what we do. When we're done milking one, we just put her out to pasture and within a week, uh, she's usually dried up anyways. It is uncomfortable for them. Um, but it's going to be uncomfortable either way. So I always feel like the cold turkey stop milking. Um, it's what works best for us. You can treat with an intramammary uh, dry treatment for mastitis prevention. Um, I would definitely say this is optional. Work with your veterinarian uh, to determine this and if, if you need to do it and how and what type of product you need to use. Um, you can test your herd prior to drying off for mastitis causing bacteria, like I said earlier. And then if you see some animals that have those bacteria, then you can treat them accordingly following those veterinarian re recommendations. I, I wouldn't say do a broad spectrum treatment of all of your goats every time you dry them off. Um, Cause if they don't need it, you know, I wouldn't give it to them, but you can definitely, if you are concerned or have worries, definitely you can test and then treat for what they have. Um, or if they don't have anything, then just dry them off and they should be okay for next, the next season. So breeding, um, these next few slides are just really basic, generic um, kind of dairy operation content that I wanted to throw in here for people looking into it to just consider. So breeding, there's three different ways that you can breed. Um, you can do pin breeding, which means you just put that buck or ram um, in with your does and ewes, and they will breed as they come into heat. You may have a more scattered um, kidding and lambing season, but usually they should get the job done within 60 days. Um, that would give them two to three full um, cycles if they aren't bred in that time frame. You either have a problem with your male or your female, so look into that. Uh, the next thing is hand breeding. If you see that uh, doe or you in showing signs of heat or estrus, you can pull her out, put her with the buck or ram for, you know, sometimes it's just a few minutes um, and get them bred that way. And then there's also artificial insemination. Typically you would use synchronization to manage that estrus and then breed using superior genetics 
to help increase um, increase the efficiency of your operation. So next would be managing those dry does and use. Um, their nutrient requirements during the dry period are gonna are uh, gonna be dependent on their stage of gestation. So if you do um, keep them milking even after they're bred and they maybe are in a later stage of gestation, they might need a higher nutrient requirement. Um, yeah, also their current condition. So that's how um, heavy or light they are. For us, we put ours out on pasture um, and we have pretty good pasture. So they, they do pretty well out there. Do, like any time of year, they almost get too fat. And so those are just um, make sure that you have feed for them during the dry period and definitely account for that when you're purchasing feed. So then after um, they have been bred and dried off, then you're going to transition them back onto that milking ration. And so usually you, you would do that about three weeks prior to parturition. Um, they should be put onto a step-up ration. And then hopefully by the time that they are giving birth, they're going to be on that full ration that they would be when they're being milked. Um, so doing this ensures that they have enough nutrients to support that final growth of the fetus, as well as start producing um, that milk and early lactation. It'll also help prevent milk fever and keep them from going off feed um, when they do come back into, into the milk herd. A couple of things for preparing for kidding, and I know kidding season is coming up for some of us, so we will have other presentations on this, but just basics, um, vaccinate with a CDT vaccine for three weeks before kidding or lambing. Consult with your veterinarian uh, on the use of multi-min or a BOCI shot if needed in your herd. I know in our herd, we started, um, we had a couple of animals that had retained placentas early in our season last year. So our veterinarian recommended multi-min and we didn't have any more. And so that's probably something we're gonna implement now. Um, we probably have a deficiency somewhere that we didn't know about and that might've been our issue. Also use FAMACHA to monitor your pregnant does. That final month of pregnancy the parasites within females can become very active um, as all those hormones are changing. That kind of stirs the parasites a little bit. So make sure to monitor them and um, don't automatically treat all of your animals or deworm them, but if they have a need, definitely treat them so that they don't have any issues um, continuing after that. And then when you get to parturition, this is super basic, um, but I'll go through it for anyone that needs a little refresher. So as birthing nears, the udder will enlarge. Um, those pelvic ligaments will relax and the vulva also enlarges. Eight to 12 hours before parturition, the cervix will dilate and the mucus plug will be expelled. Um, most often they will isolate themselves and then that fetus will move through the birth canal. Um, as it's moving, the water sac is usually pushed out first and then within, you know, hopefully 30 to 45 minutes, um, that kid or lamb is born. So after kidding, you have a fresh dough. Um, that transition from a dry dough to a fresh dough can be very stressful. So body condition leading up to that is really important. Um, if you have an animals that are too thin, they might have small kids with low vitality and low milk yield. So if you have a thin animal, you had a hard time getting condition on her, um, just remember that as she gets closer to kidding, that you probably need to be there to help her um, as well as help that, help the young animal um, get up on its feet and get some milk. If they're too fat, they can also have issues with kidding, um, difficult, uh, they can develop ketosis. And again, if they're too fat, they may also have a low milk yield. So just some things to be mindful of looking forward to that, um, to just think about. Then they'll obviously have their first milk or that colostrum. Um, it's that milk immediately after parturition. It's very thick and yellow. Um, it has a lot of really good stuff for the newborn kids and lambs. So you wanna make sure um, that you get that colostrum into that young animal as quickly as possible. Whether you're letting it nurse, or you're gonna milk it out and put it in a bottle. It just needs to get in that. And that may be within, you know, I like within an hour. <laughs> That's, that's just me, at least two hours, um, I think you would be fine. The second milk still has some evidence of colostrum, 
Um, it's still really good milk. If you have, especially with these dairy animals, if they have a lot of extra milk, definitely milk that out and freeze it. And you can use it for, um, you know, most people say up to six months. We've definitely used ours past a year, probably not too much longer than that. Um, but it's still really good to have. So freeze it if you do have extra. Um, and those first two milkings should be withheld from the tank because they are going to be a thicker consistency and things like that. They just don't need to go into, you know, what would be considered human consumption. Um, so do withhold those. The next thing is the trans period for the female. So the two to three days after kidding, the dough is going to start to come into milk. Um, that transition can be very stressful. So during this time, you need to monitor uh, their temperature. If you see them acting off, definitely take a temperature. Um, that can be signs of mastitis or uterine infection. Um, this goat, it's not a great picture, but you can kind of see um, this goat had the routine placenta I was talking about. She also had tons of milk. She didn't have mastitis, but she had so much milk. She was so engorged and she had um, three kids. And so we were constantly trying to get that milk out so that they could nurse. I um, mean, we could have some of that extra milk, but she was always full of milk. Um, so just keep an eye on them during that time. It can be a lot going on with engorgement, um, retained placentas, things like that. That vaginal drainage is normal for the first few days, but more than a week can indicate problems. Also, if you see any um, like milky appearance in that discharge, that can be signs of an infection. If it has any off scent, that can also be signs of an infection. So um, definitely kind of pay attention to those things and call that if you have any issues. The early lamb care, um, obviously you're gonna clean off their, clean out their airways, dry and warm them. Um, if the dam didn't do that, dip the navel, navel cord in an iodine solution and then trim it to about three or four inches. If you have an aggressive mother that's like chewing on that navel and things like that, um, you can trim them a little shorter so that they don't pull on that and then feed colostrum um, as soon as possible after birth. So in summary, uh, definitely choose a breed that works for you. You have to be able to want to go out there and see them every day and enjoy taking care of them. So make sure to pick something that you like looking at and that your family is gonna enjoy. Um, don't buy the cheap ones, you get what you pay for. So if you buy an, an animal, an animal um, for cheap, it may have some issues as well. So definitely do your research when looking into um, animals. There's a lot of great breeders around. Um, you can get on the American Dairy Goat Association webpage. They have lists of breeders and I'm sure there's some, um, there's some all over the place. So I bet you could find one within a few hours if you're really seriously looking into getting goats or sheep. Um, I don't know if there's a sheep registry, but if so, I can find that and help you look for them as well. Use that five-step milking protocol. Make sure, again, to have a sanitary um, milking system, have a sanitary, you know, sanitation protocol, and definitely um, take care of your animal's udder, and that will set you up for success. And then monitor for those health issues during transition um, from dry dough into their lactation a really stressful time period for them. Um, so doing whatever you can to help them make that transition uh, will help you and them. I guess I'll take questions now. Awesome. You do have a couple of questions. Anybody who's still listening and has questions, make sure to put them in their uh, Q&A box or the chat box and we'll get to them as we go along here. Um, the first question is, what is a good way to test for somatic cells strips or filters? Um, I, I guess the best way to test for somatic cell for that I have seen is just to submit a sample because then you'll get a number. Um, I guess I don't understand the strips or filters. We, we do the stripping in the strip cup um, and any time that we see like chunks there, it's kind of like almost like cottage cheese. Um, then we'll test that goat sometimes they just will get a congested udder and it doesn't have any cause. It's just, you know, they laid on it funny or something like that. Um, so that's something to also watch out for. But I, I guess the best way to test is to send it into a, a lab, a milk lab and have them give you a number. 
Um, and then I see the, is your pre and post dip the same? They are not the same. Um, our post dip is an iodine solution. Our pre dip, now that I'm here, I can't remember it, but I can look it up and I will find that. It's a blue, um, gosh, I can't remember what it's, it, it says pre dip on the bottle. We buy it from Dairy Supply, um, but I can try and find the exact name for you. Want me to just keep reading these, Melinda, or do you want to read them? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the next question I have was, can you use a California mastitis test? Yes, you can. Um, we have done that, and it has picked up mastitis in our animals. So yes, you can use the California test. Um, I use the California to check for somatic cell. I have not um, used it to check for our somatic cell count. I'll dismiss that one. Um, I haven't used the California test to check our somatic cell, but we have used it to check for mastitis. But in my experience, when we do our monthly milk test, if we see a high somatic cell, then we will just test our herd for any um, mastitis causing bacteria at a lab, and they will give you a printout of any bacteria that was found in the milk, which is super helpful for us. Because sometimes um, there's mastitis causing bacteria and there is just bacteria. And sometimes um, the ones that aren't mastitis causing aren't as much of a concern. So that test has helped us in that way. Carmen, you did have one more Q&A just pop up. Okay. Um, it says, I understand yeah. hyper vigor is about different species, not different breeds, but is there any hybrid vigor found in mixed breeds such as Nubian Nigerian dwarf? Um, I can't answer that fully because I don't know if there is hybrid vigor when mixing those breeds. I know people will mix those breeds because um, there's the Nigerian dwarf has really high components. Um, and so when you mix them with other breeds, they can bring the component up in that breed, but then they are a smaller animal. So then they can also kind of bring down the size in different breeds. Um, so I can't exactly answer that. So while I don't have an answer for that specific cross of breeds, I will say that if there's something that one breed has that you really like and the other breed has that you really like and you want to cross them, you are going to get some good hybrid vigor out of that. So that's just yeah. you know, from a from a crossbreeding standpoint, it's never a bad thing to crossbreed if you're trying to target a specific um, trait. Yeah. Or a specific couple of traits, I should say. Yeah. And my email for anybody that has like I'll try and send April my pre that we buy. Um, but if anybody else has specific questions, um, just find my email. It's cwellmore at uidaho.edu, but it's on a bunch of Melinda's flyers. So it should be somewhere. Awesome. Well, oh, I'll, I I'll answer this. You want me to answer this last question? Sure. We've got time. So it says, when you hand strip the teats into the screen, do you worry about getting the teat dirty with your hand? Do you clean your stripping hand each time? Um, yes, we wear gloves. So we just have, um, you know, little, what are they? The blue gloves that you buy at the farm store. Um, nitrile gloves, I think that's what they are. They're just single use gloves. So when I come out to the barn, I will get everything set up. I will get the feed in the feeder. I'll get the goats in, I'll put my gloves on, um, and then I do the whole spray strip. Um, and between each animal, we use hand sanitizer on the glove so that the glove is sanitized each time. And that has worked great for us. We've done that for a couple of years now. Awesome. Is that, we've got one more, looks like. Can a Can dough, dough dry off early? Can, it, can a doe dry off early after being bred and pregnant as early as two months after breeding? Yes. 
Um, sometimes they will dry themselves off without even being pregnant. We've had that too. <laughs> um, oh, chlorhexidine. Yes, our blue, our, that's right. Thank you, Mark. Our pre-dip is chlorhexidine solution. Um, so yeah, they can breed off two months after breeding or they can dry off two months after breeding. Sometimes they will just dry off because they feel like it, it feels like. <laughs> um, do you cut the so, tail? I think uh, so just, you ban tails on sheep. Yeah, you can, you can cut them or ban them as long as you have um, typically a crusher, a crushing type um, cutter or a band, but you wanna do that when they're young and not when they're older. Yep, and I don't exactly know what you mean by M-U-N in goats, um, but I can look into it, Deborah. Okay, um, well with that, I think we'll go ahead and um, stop the questions. If you guys have any more, reach out to myself or Carmen. And um, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Carmen, for coming on and sharing your expertise in the goat world. I know that we've had some interest in more goat specific topics. So we will do our best to do that for you guys. But just know that each week, even though sometimes we're emphasizing sheep more than goats, a lot of what we talk about still applies. So don't not join just because it doesn't say goat specifically. I apologize for that because you have two hosts that are sheep folks and one goat person. So it's a little weighted that way, um, but we try not to do that to you guys. So um, just a disclaimer there. And next week we are going to have a discussion with Dan Macon and he's gonna give us some feedback on whether or not guardian dogs are appropriate for our um, sheep and goat herds. So make sure you join us next week. And as always, catch any webinars that you may have missed on our YouTube channel. That's the University of Idaho Extension Livestock channel. And thanks again for joining and we'll see you next week.